So as Marcy mentioned, uh, I'm Jason Smart, Manager of Engineering Technology at the American Wood Council. And uh, I'll be starting us off with a brief introduction and overview of what DCA3 is. Uh, but then I'm going to turn it over to Paul after just a few slides so he can explain the code provisions relating to uh, topics addressed in this document in DCA3. Then I'll follow up again after Paul to describe what's what's in DCA3 in more detail and, uh, and also explain how this document can be used to show code compliance. But first, I'm going to let Marcy take a a really quick poll here so that we can determine the makeup of our audience. That's right. As always, we want to know what your profession is. We have 52% engineers, 33% code officials, 7% architect, 5% builders, manufacturers, and other, and 2% fire service. We are delighted that all of you are here and hope that all of you find something to take back to your, your places of work. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thanks for joining us. And uh, looks like we're a little heavier in the uh, engineers uh, in this afternoon session than we were in the morning session. Uh, I think morning session was a little more uh, evened out amongst the different professions, but uh, I'm glad you're all here. Thanks. Um, so since you're here for this webinar, I presume that you either have some idea of what DCA3 is or you'd like to learn more about it. Uh, DCA3 is a part of a series of AWC publications called the Design for Code Acceptance Series, and that's where the DCA comes from, it's an acronym. It can be accessed and downloaded for free on the AWC website at the address shown here at the bottom of this slide. DCA3 deals specifically with fire resistance ratings, sound ratings, and example details for light frame wood assemblies. It provides fire resistance data for tested wall and floor ceiling assemblies, and it provides sound insulation data for floor ceiling assemblies only, not for wall assemblies. Uh, and it provides example details for exterior wall floor intersections in type three platform construction. We'll talk about each of these in more detail later in this webinar after Paul gives us an overview of the code provisions pertaining to these topics. But first though, I'd like to uh, define a couple of the terms that I've used uh, so far in this in this presentation, and uh, the first one is the term fire resistance. I'm sure you already know that uh, fire resistance or uh, fire resistance ratings are both uh, very important concepts in codes and standards. In the ASTM fire test standards that are developed under the ASTM E5 uh, committee, uh, this term fire resistance is defined as the ability of a material product or assembly to withstand fire or give protection for it for a period of time. Building codes provide minimum fire resistance rating requirements for certain types of building assemblies to, for the purpose of slowing the spread of fire from one part of the building to another. Typically, these minimum fire resistance rating requirements are specified in one hour increments, either one, two, or three hour ratings. And then uh, the second term that I wanted to define is sound insulation. In the ASTM acoustic standards, um, sound insulation is defined as the capacity of a structure to prevent sound from reaching a receiving location. The building code requires certain wall and floor ceiling assemblies to meet minimum sound insulation requirements. The, the two laboratory tests that are, uh, that are used are uh, uh, ASTM E90 and E492. These are for two different types of uh, sound parameters or sound transmission parameters that we'll talk about. Uh, one of them is uh, sound transmission class, uh, that's STC. This is a parameter they use, use to express airborne sound insulation. And then impact insulation class or IIC is a parameter used to express impact or structure borne sound insulation. We'll talk about more of those, uh, or we'll talk more about those in more detail later. Uh, but um, in general, these sound insulation provisions apply to assemblies that separate dwellings. And Paul's gonna give more detail, kind of fill that in a little bit in just a minute. Lastly, uh, I also wanted to define the term wood frame construction because that's what DCA3 uh, is uh, it, it pertains to wood frame construction. Um, 
And in fact, it's uh, important to note that all of the assemblies described in DCA3 are light frame wood assemblies. So in other words, they're constructed primarily of dimension lumber framing, engineered wood products and sheathing. So, uh, and um, of course, wood frame construction is uh, defined as construction in which the primary structural system consists of wood members and assemblies. Here's a quick uh, overview of what's covered, what's discussed in DCA3. It provides descriptions of rated uh, floor ceiling and wall assemblies. For the floor ceiling assemblies, DCA3 provides data on both fire resistance ratings and sound ratings. For the wall assemblies, it, it only gives fire resistance ratings, not sound ratings, but uh, it, it covers both symmetrical and asymmetrical walls. And I'll show you some of the details for those later on. In addition to these floor and wall assemblies, DCA3 also provides example details for common configurations of exterior wall to floor intersections in type three platform construction. Again, we'll talk about those later on also, uh, but first I'm gonna turn it, over to, turn it over to Paul Coates so that he can tell us about the code provisions relating to fire resistance rating and sound rating requirements for these assemblies. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Jason. And hello, everyone. Uh, let's do a quick review of how fire resistance is established and here on the screen are the alternatives given in the code uh, as they and they begin with section 702. There are some slight uh, changes to a few of these slides from what was posted um, but in general you should have no trouble following if you did download the pdf and we'll replace it later. Um, but tested assemblies of course and the standards are given here ASTME 119 and 263. Uh, they're they're the basis for all the other methods and designers and code officials can use the descriptions in the test reports themselves to confirm fire resistance. And the second bullet point here, uh, fire resistance rated designs described in approved sources or by approved agencies. Approved in the code always means approved by the code official. Um, this would include AWC's DCA3 document that's our subject today. But there are many other approved sources, of course, typically UL Fire Resistance Directory, Gypsum Association, Fire Resistance Manual, and others. The DCA3 and other sources make the testing and research more usable and accessible. So the third bullet here are the prescriptive descriptions of assemblies in the table in section 721 of the IBC. The fourth point, uh, indicates calculation methods in IBC 2722 and AWC's NDS, uh, which is referenced in section 722. So of the, there are two primary methods, uh, there are two methods for calculation of fire resistance. One of them is specifically for one hour frame assemblies, both floor, floor and wall. That one's called the component additive method the data from many tests was studied and conservative times were assigned to the elements of common frame assemblies. And you can go back to 722.6, find the tables, put together from a design standpoint, a one hour fire resistance rated assembly, either wall or floor. The second primary method in the calculation method is the fire resistance of exposed timber beams or columns or panelized elements of mass timber, that is cross laminated timber, wall, floor, and roof sections. The principle of the calculated method for exposed timber is to design load bearing building elements with greater dimensions than would be required for carrying the structural loads only so that elements perform their function under fire conditions uh, even after it a beam or a column has lost a significant cross section during a fire, uh, they can still perform their function. That's how they are assigned to fire resistance rating. And 722 of the IBC sends you to chapter 16 of the NDS uh, for those fire design calculations. And finally, the last two points, engineering analysis that utilizes comparisons of test data from ASTME 119, that's permitted. 
along with the alternative materials and methods approvals 104.11 that's a broad way as we all know to approve something that's not specifically prescribed in the code marcy i'm gonna let them do a poll question could you take this I certainly can. DCA 3 addresses which wood frame assemblies. Is that A, floor ceiling assemblies, B, wall assemblies, C, exterior wall floor intersections, D, answers A and B, or E, all of the above? It looks like 63% say all of the above, 30% say answers A and B, and just a little bit for the others. So, Paul, I'm going to ask you to tell us what the real answer is. Mm -hmm. The real answer is all of the above, E. And the exterior wall floor intersection details are the newcomer to DCA3. And so some of you may have missed that in the introduction, uh, but it's all of the above. All right, let's continue with our uh, code provision review. We're we're going to be talking about frame assemblies in DCA3, not heavy timber, not mass timber. So shown here are frame assemblies that may need to be fire resistance rated. They're organized in, as they are organized in the IBC. So each of these is a different animal. And I, I like to refer them as different animals uh, to remind us um, that the important thing about these is that each type of fire resistance rated element here has its own code section and its own rules in that code section. Now they share code provisions with other sections, but each of these has its own rules, such as for termination. For example, does, does this fire resistance rated wall have to go up to the floor above and so forth? You'll find that in the, in the section with the element. Openings, penetration protection, you always start in these individual sections, continuity of the fire resistance rating and so forth. We're gonna talk a little bit more about each of these. Let's start with walls and floors that are required to be rated due to construction type. For instance, a type 5A building has to have one hour fire resistance rated walls and floors. Uh, general provisions for building elements. By building elements, I mean the bones of the building, typically the load bearing, but also um, you have to pay attention to non-load bearing as well. But um, the general provisions, including some provisions for other fire resistance rated elements in the list we just looked at, are found in section 704. So unique to this particular category, that is rated based on construction type, what it says in table 601, unique to this is there are no requirements for the limitation or protection of any openings or penetrations in these elements if they're only required to be rated based on table 601, you don't have to worry about those. And speaking of table 601, here it is. Uh, so for instance, uh, I'm gonna reach down here to get a laser pointer. And um, so for instance, uh, you can see right away, glancing at table 601, that the type 5A exterior wall is one hour. Type 5B exterior wall, load bearing, uh, two hours. You can also see that ratings for uh, non-bearing non exterior walls are governed also by another table here, table 602, uh, which has to do with proximity to property lines, fire separation distance. We're all familiar with this table, refer to it quite often, I'm sure. Um, let's go on to, here we go. The next animal, exterior walls, section 705. Uh, there's some uh, slight modifications to this slide as well. I'll just alert you, we'll, we'll have that up later. Um, but if you did print out the PDF, it may vary just a little bit. So first, exterior walls, they, they have a unique set of structural requirements uh, related to their performance in fire. And, there's a section in there on structural stability and termination, and so forth. They have unique materials requirements and materials of exterior walls are limited in a different way in some construction types than for the interior elements and certainly in type three and four, this is especially true. The third bullet uh, here is 
what determines the rating of an exterior wall? Very simple. The more restrictive rating in either table 601 or table 602. When it all comes down to it, that's all you have to look for, the more exterior rating. And then for at the last bullet point here, this code requirement applies to all exterior walls, no matter what the reason for the rating, whether 601 or 602, only walls that are 10 feet or less between them, have 10 feet or less distance to the property line. They are required to be rated for, or designed to be rated for exposure from the exterior as well as the interior. So that is both sides of the wall are designed for fire exposure. Um, symmetric fire resistance is required for all interior walls as a rule uh, when they are required to be rated, but not for exterior walls unless they are within 10 feet of the property line. So another way to say it is uh, any exterior wall that's 10 feet or more from the property line, regardless of the reason for the rating, is required to be rated for fire exposure from the interior only. Let's take a look at these just a little closer. Now you see I've highlighted here uh, the ratings for type three and type four exterior bearing walls because there's a little bit of an anomaly here. Uh, we can note right away that types three and four have this rather unusual requirement for two hour rated exterior walls. And not only that, but when you go into the code text uh, for these construction types, it requires these walls to be non-combustible or fire retardant treated wood. So why, why is this? What are the origins of this requirement for type three and four? What's its purpose? These types of buildings in urban downtown areas of towns and cities historically across the country, we're, we're all very familiar with downtown uh, development like this, historical development. Sometimes these kind of buildings have been uh, referred to as ordinary construction as a general term. It's an old term, it's not used much anymore. What did this refer to? Well, buildings with masonry exterior walls and interior structures of heavy timber or wood frame, that's what it referred to, these very buildings. Uh, buildings like these were really the prototype, you could say, prototypes pattern for what would be described in the first legacy model codes as type three or type four construction. So, why is this, uh, just to back up here, so now we can begin to see, I'm backing up one slide. Now I'm gonna see why we have this two hour non-combustible exterior wall requirement, and perhaps the non-combustible as well. It makes sense, doesn't it? The early code writers knew that the performance of these buildings, they tried to imitate that in the description of the construction type, which is still uh, type three. Still same construction description for type three and type four, and I'm gonna, revisit this a little bit later before I give it back to Jason. But here's table 602. Uh, this is the other table governing rating of exterior walls. This is based on fire separation distance and it's, it's self-explanatory. Again, you take the more restrictive of this table or table 601. And as we said, just a little graphic here, the only time you have to protect the exterior side of the exterior wall is if it's within 10 feet or less of the property line. Marcy, let's do another uh, poll question, please. Yes, indeed, let's do that. Load-bearing wood-framed exterior walls in type three construction must have one hour fire resistance rating, must have a two hour fire resistance rating, must be framed with fire retardant treated wood? Answers A and C only? Answers B and C only? 47% say answer E, that's answers B and C only. 35% say must have a two hour fire resistance rating. So let's see which of those two answers are correct. Mm -hmm. It is E, it is B and C only. Now this was a little tricky because we, we predicated the, the stem here on being wood framed. So if it is wood framed, yes, it must be FRTW. And then we discussed the two hours. So 
You can also have non-combustible uh, non walls on the exterior. And if we hadn't put that up there, then 35% of you would have been right just the two hours. But anyway, a little bit tricky. All right, let's go ahead, forge forward on these elements, these different animals. The biggest and baddest is firewalls. The term firewall should be reserved for the, an actual firewall in accordance with 706. So firewalls are the most restrictive in terms of materials. In types three and four construction, they cannot be wood frame, even with FRTW. Only in type five can firewalls be wood frame. They have their own termination requirements, fire resistance, ratings, opening restrictions. They can serve to separate a structure into two completely separate buildings in regard to allowable size. And fire barriers are a notch below firewalls. They are often called for in the IBC. And you can see in that last bullet there, they are required to serve such things as shaft enclosures, exits, occupancy separations, hazmat control areas, fire areas related to sprinkler requirements and other uses. And they also have their own unique termination requirements. In the case of walls, they must extend to the floor deck above, always in a multi-story wood frame. Um, and then finally, we have the lowly fire partitions, very important because they're called for between dwelling units, but they have their own unique requirements as well. And what about floors now? Horizontal assemblies are defined in the code as any floor assembly that's required to be rated for any reason. The openings and penetrations are always limited or require protection. As a general principle, and indeed it's stated in 704, that building elements supporting a rated horizontal assembly has to have the same rating as the horizontal assemblies uh, supported. Now, all these that we've talked about, just in review, they all have to have some continuity to perform. The code has extensive requirements for penetration, opening protection, or some type of restriction in fire resistance rate of wall and floor assemblies. And there's, there is such an animal as a fire resistant joint system. You'll see in the third po bullet point here. And uh, there's a definition for the joints it's intended to address. Uh, so fire resistant joints are not typically required in wood frame platform construction because there's no space between the, the rated ele elements, they're tight connections. And uh, this, this provision for the joint system is intended to address openings such as uh, expansion joints or just openings created by dissimilar materials and so forth. All right, how about this circumstance? We have a shaft wall and a floor coming into it and they're not rated the same. So, uh, so this is not uncommon, of course. Many construction types call for this very thing if you're gonna build platform construction. So, so because of the general provisions in 704, the supporting construction has to be rated the same as the construction supported. And in this case, you can see the floor definitely supports the, um, supports the uh, wall above. So how, how do we handle this? It's not, uh, it's not an easy question because the code really doesn't address it directly. And there have been plenty of a pretty wide variety of solutions uh, for this concern. A long time ago, this was not even considered a problem. Uh, but many designers and code officials now are requiring certain measures to have some quantifiable way to provide continuity of fire resistance for this intersection. Uh, and um, by the way, there are no standardized fire resistance tests for intersections like this or for any connections in wood frame or other construction types. Um, sometimes it can be included in E119 testing, but there's no standardized uh, connection testing itself. But there are some ways to address it in a systematic way about how protection might be provided. Let's take a look. So um, the same issue, same principle happens in type three construction. They have the same challenges. So right now, I'd just like to pause for a moment while you look at this slide and uh, remind you 
of the origin of the exterior wall requirement for type three in the IBC. Remember those pictures of downtown buildings? Those benefited from masonry two hour rated exterior walls because their connection and proximity to each other, they needed that. Uh, just remember the origin here. Then the modern type three building with ample fire separation distance, which is now required in the code, it's very difficult to assign a, re a critical reason for the material restriction, first of all, and then for the two hour rating for the exterior wall. Now we can't change the code. There's been no relaxation of the two hour rating at the perimeter of the building, but, but I would submit that it's hard to identify the benefit in safety for the building itself, for the higher rating of the wall than the floor. And I'm bringing this up and I'm emphasizing this so that we can have some context for the discussion on the variety of solutions that are being offered uh, for this detail. I, I believe the question of fire resistance continuity at this intersection uh, warrants practical solutions, not highly restrictive or complicated ones. And there are many structural benefits to the strong platform connection. And that connection shouldn't be jeopardized for the sake of protecting for instance, the wall from the building uh, itself. All right now, now back to this point on the slide. The DCA3 uh, gives practical guidance. That's what the new exterior wall floor intersection details are for, uh, providing details that, that, that retain the fire resistance, provide the fire resistance, the continuity. Uh, but first of all, we have to agree, or the approach here that we've taken is, we think it's very practical, is that make sure that all parts of the floor assembly are considered part of the floor, not the wall. Uh, and secondly, at the same time, uh, since the floor does extend into the plane of the wall uh, and it does support the upper portions of the wall, the code does require the fire resistance to be provided for supporting this construction two hours at the intersection. And this is very conservative, but it's what the code requires. We already know, just by way of review, that the framing and exterior walls of type three can be FRTW, fire retardant treated wood. Um, this makes it possible to build a completely uh, wood frame type three. This slide is a little bit of a repeat, but uh, it's addressing specifically the FRTW. You'll observe in the details of the DCA3, I'll show you in a minute, and Jason will give you more details about that soon that the exterior wall elements are required to be FRTW, the wall elements, but not the floor elements. This is consistent with the code. But continuity, in the last point here, does have to be a fire resistance. And there's a distinction here. The distinction we're making is that the presence of FRTW doesn't necessarily affect the fire resistance. It could be, it could be no better with uh, a fire resistance built with uh, FRTW the fire resistance testing really doesn't give uh, much credit. Um, there, there are two distinct uh, purposes here. One is flame spread and one is fire resistance. In the testing, fire resistance is distinct. The flame spread uh, is a different test, different purpose, different risk. Okay. All right, so, uh, so how, do, how does the DCA3 uh, approach this? Well, calculations per IBC section 722 and engineering analysis, these are two of the alternatives permitted. Jason will go through these details. Uh, let's go on to sound just for a brief uh, introduction to the requirements in the code for sound before I turn it over to Jason. Um, 1206, first of all, they apply uh, Sound transmission performance requirements apply to dwelling units and sleeping units between them and between them and uh, public areas such as corridors. Now you will want to consult the definition of sleeping unit in chapter two, it will clear up a question. It makes it clear that sleeping areas that meet the description of a sleeping unit but are within a dwelling unit are not sleeping units. So the, there is no intention there's no chance of this being required between individual bedrooms you know, of the same dwelling unit. And Jason went over what STC is, sound transmission class, IIC, impact insulation class, um, separate tests, separate uh, 
criteria uh, or the same uh, same uh, performance criteria, however, in the end, uh, but separate tests. <clears throat> All right. Um, so you have the requirements in the in the code for testing, and the standards from the code section are shown here. Separate test standards E90, E492. Please note that uh, in the a change to the 2018 code in here now that you may not have seen yet is that engineering analysis is permitted to be used based on comparisons to the data from tested assemblies for sound. It's a very practical provision uh, to avoid needing to test in every circumstance. And the practicality goes beyond that, but I'll let Jason explain that. But finally, you have general provisions for alternative methods allowed under IBC. That's also within these provisions specifically mentioned. I'm gonna turn it back over to Jason now and uh, there'll be time for questions at the end of the program or you can type them in. Jason, do you wanna take it from here? Yes, thanks, okay. So now that Paul has uh, taken us on a brief trip through the uh, code requirements that deal with both fire resistance ratings and sound uh, rating requirements, um, I just wanted to show this slide again. This is the one that Paul started us off on um, because it's a good, both a recap and a segue into what I'm gonna talk about. But these are the, remember, these are the methods, the code, uh, code allowed methods for establishing fire resistance ratings in accordance with IBC section 703 and, and in accordance with IBC section 702, which is uh, testing in accordance with uh, E119 or UL um, 263. Uh, so of course you, you're allowed to have testing or any one of these following, uh, there are actually six different uh, options there. We're gonna show you how DCA3 uses multiple, uh, more, than, more than just one of these in order to demonstrate that uh, compliance as far as fire resistance ratings and sound ratings go. The fire resistance ratings given in DCA3 are Compliant, uh, are in compliance with at least three of these code established methods that I just showed. Specifically, uh, the assemblies are, are that are described in DCA3 were all tested in accordance with ASTM E119. And then also DCA3 is typically considered an approved source. And then thirdly, uh, it is it, the assemblies that are provided within DCA3 are either duplicates or very, very similar assemblies to those that are prescribed in IBC section 721, specifically in tables uh, 721.1, parent two for the wall assemblies and parent three for the floor ceiling assemblies. So as you can see, the fire resistance ratings of the assemblies described in DCA3 are justifiable through multiple avenues that are allowed under the IBC. Table one provides descriptions of one hour fire resistance rated assemblies. It includes a mixture of some, some asymmetrical assemblies and some, uh, some symmetrical assemblies. And the, uh, the ratings for the symmetrical assemblies apply to exposure from either side, but of course, not both sides simultaneously as, as this scenario would never be required by the code, you know, simultaneous exposure from both sides. So it's, uh, that's why I say it's, uh, the ratings are applicable from either side. The ratings for asymmetrical assemblies apply to exposure from the interior side, which is the side to which the gypsum wallboard is applied in these assemblies. Table two describes a two hour fire resistance rated wall assembly. This is a symmetrical wall assembly. And so it's because of that, it can be rated from either side or it is rated from either side uh, interchangeably. And then in both of these tables, there are embedded links that take the reader to detailed descriptions of each individual assembly. So we'll show you what some of those look like, um, some of the pages that you'd be taken to if you click on those links. Uh, for example, if you click on some of the links in either table one or table two, it'll take you to a page within DCA3 that looks like this, like the image you see on the right side of your screen right now. And uh, this is for one particular wall assembly. This is WS4-1.1. That's the designation given to it in DCA3. 
Um, let's hone in on the symmetrical one hour wall assemblies, which this particular assembly is one of them. Uh, they all have a single layer of 5 8 inch type X gypsum wall board on both sides. And then uh, DCA3 lists four of these symmetrical one hour wall assemblies. One of them is framed with two by four studs and the other three are framed with two by six studs, all of them at uh, 16 inches on center. As far as insulation goes, one of these assemblies has fiberglass insulation, two have mineral wool insulation, and uh, the other assembly doesn't require any insulation. Uh, that just means that I say it doesn't require, but uh, you, can, you can put insulation in it. That would not hurt the uh, fire resistance rating of it, but uh, no insulation is required in, in order to attain the uh, fire resistance rating that's given for it. And it's important to note that all four of these symmetrical assemblies are rated under 100% design load. And then there are a total of five asymmetrical one hour fire assemblies or wall assemblies in DCA3. Uh, two of these have two by four studs spaced at 16 inches. Two have two by six studs that are spaced at 16 inches. And then one of them uh, has two by, six, two by six studs at 24 inches on center. All five of these assemblies require insulation. Two have fiberglass and the other three have uh, mineral wool insulation. Most of these assemblies, uh, just as with the first set that I showed you, the symmetrical wall assemblies, most of them are rated under 100% design load, but there is one assembly that's uh, is limited to 78% of the design load. This is simply because the fire resistance test that was performed for that assembly uh, at the time that it was performed, it was loaded to 100% of its design load, but um, under its current design values for, for the um, framing members that were used, uh, that would be uh, equivalent to 78% of its current design values. So in other words, the design, one of the design values for that lumber that was used for that, uh, that, tested, that one particular tested assembly, uh, those design values went up. And uh, so now, Basically, uh, it's uh, the current. Uh, if you recalculated, you know, the, how how much it was loaded as a percentage of its current design values, it would only be 78%. And we saw a question about that when uh, people were registering for this, so I figured I'd go ahead and answer that uh, hopefully in advance here. The two-hour wall assemblies describe, or there's only one actually. The the two-hour wall assembly described in DCA3 has two by six studs at 24 inches on center. It has mineral wool insulation and two layers of 5 8 inch Type X gypsum wall board on each side. Since this is a symmetrical assembly, the two-hour fire resistance rating can be applied to exposure from either side. And as with most of the other wall assemblies, it's rated under 100% design load. The assemblies in DCA3 are uh, described exactly as they were tested in accordance with ASTM E119. However, certain optional variations to these assemblies are justifiable and they should be allowed. Such variations include stud framing options to use any species and grade of lumber that's, that meets IVC section 2303.1.1. And then also in the case of exterior walls, any code permitted exterior wall covering can be used on, on that exterior side of the wall, provided that it's applied in a manner that meets uh, applicable code provisions. So that covers the wall assemblies. Now let's talk about the floor ceiling assemblies that are given in DCA3. Table three provides a summary of the one hour assemblies. There are a total of, of seven of these one hour floor ceiling assemblies that are given in DCA3. This includes a variety of single layer and double layer assemblies, most of, most of which have steel furring. Uh, what, what I mean by that is that uh, there's the ceiling membrane is attached to either a hat channel, a steel hat channel or a steel resilient channel, which in turn is attached to the bottom flanges of the framing members, the joists. And just as with tables one and two, which lists the wall assemblies, table three includes lists, uh, it includes links, I should say, which take the reader directly to uh, the more detailed descriptions of each of these assemblies. 
four of these one hour floor ceiling assemblies are what we call single layer assemblies. This simply means that it has one single layer of gypsum board making up the ceiling membrane. All of them have eye joist framing at 24 inches on center or less. And they, uh, they all utilize um, resilient channels or hat channels. And they all have mineral wool insulation within the framing cavities. Again, right, right now what I'm talking about is the single layer, one hour rated floor ceiling assemblies. But then there are also um, three one hour assemblies that utilize a double layer membrane. So since these assemblies are, they're rated for one hour instead of not, not two hours, uh, and they have two layers, um, only half inch uh, type X gypsum board is required instead of the 5 eighths inch, because you have those two layers there. The eye joist framing members are spaced at a maximum of 24 inches on center, just as, as with all of the other assemblies. And uh, these double layer assemblies vary somewhat with respect to the presence of insulation and steel furring. So they don't all require mineral wool. Uh, in fact, one of them uh, doesn't require any insulation. Um, as you can see in the diagram or the, um, the screenshot figure that you see on the right side of your screen, uh, that one requires um, uh, fiberglass insulation instead of mineral wool. So there are other options there. And then the, there is one two hour floor ceiling assembly that's described in table four of DCA3. Aside from being the only two hour rated assembly in DCA3, this, this particular assembly is unique in that it requires three layers of 5 8 inch type X gypsum board. Steel furring is used between the base layer of this gypsum board and the middle layer. And fiberglass insulation is used between the framing members. Just as with all the other floor ceiling assemblies that are listed in DCA3, uh, this two hour rated assembly has eye joist framing at 24 inches on center, and it's also rated for 100% for of its design load. A number of optional variations are also mentioned within DCA3 for these floor ceiling assemblies. In fact, there are more optional variations allowed for the floor ceiling assemblies than there are for the wall assemblies. So these include options for the floor topping, framing, insulation, and floor covering. Floor topping options include normal weight concrete or lightweight concrete, or uh, gypsum concrete or no topping at all. And then framing options, uh, the options for variations in the framing include, um, you can uh, have joist spacings up to 24 inches and uh, any, any spacing less than that. Um, and then also you can have uh, flange sizes and web thicknesses that are greater than the specified minimums that are given in DCA3. Any code permitted floor covering can also be used on top of the, the assembly and uh, any insulation thickness that's greater than, the, greater than or equal to the specified minimum insulation thickness can be used. The optional variations I've mentioned here apply to all of the floor ceiling assemblies that are described in DCA3, but there are also some other options which apply specifically to, or they apply to specific assemblies, but not to the other ones. The fire resistance ratings of, of, these, of all these assemblies still apply if any combination of these allowable variations is made. So um, the, in other words, these variations that are mentioned don't change the fire resistance rating that's specified in DCA3. However, they do affect the sound ratings, and I'll talk about that a little later at the end of this presentation. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, DCA3 also provides some example exterior wall floor intersection details. And Paul already gave us a, a really good overview of the building code provisions related to these construction features. So I'm gonna summarize the DCA3 examples example details for you and uh, explain the rationale behind them. These, these examples provide um, ways of, ways of uh, showing compliance with the code provisions dealing with these intersections. Firstly, I wanted to reiterate that these details apply specifically to type three platform construction in which wood framing members are used in the exterior walls. The primary objective that, they're, that these details are intended to fulfill is to provide details that will ensure continuity of the fire resistance rating through the floor from the wall above to the wall below. 
And then a secondary objective for these details is to identify which framing members within these intersections are required to be fire, fire retardant treated in accordance with the building code. In these example details, the continuity of the code specified two hour fire resistance rating is established through two out of the six methods uh, that are specified in IBC section 703.3. Specifically, these are calculations that are in accordance with IBC section 722, uh, which references chapter 16 of the national design spe specification. And then also we used uh, engineering analysis that's based on a comparison to data uh, on, on tested building elements tested in accordance with E119. So Marcy, uh, could you ask this polling question of the audience? In type three construction, IBC 602.3 requires which of the following wood members to be fire retardant treated wood? Is that framing and sheathing in the interior walls, framing and sheathing in, in the exterior walls, framing and sheathing in the floor assembly, framing and sheathing in portions of the floor assembly, or answers in B and D only? We've got 63% say answers B and D only, and 32% say framing and sheathing in the exterior walls. Jason, why don't you tell us which one is really the answer? Okay, sure, yeah. Um, so the, uh, the correct answer, this is a little bit tricky here, but um, uh, when we reference specifically IBC section 602.3, which is the only place where, um, you know, where it talks about where FRTW, fire retardant treated wood is required in exterior walls of type three construction. It explicitly says, you know, that the uh, framing and sheathing, by the way, sheathing was added recently. So that's why all of these have the sheathing, they say sheathing there. Um, it's required to be fire retardant treated only in the exterior walls. There's no explicit requirement for, um, for fire retardant treated wood to be used uh, anywhere in the floor assemblies. And the reason it's a little bit tricky is because with, um, with platform construction, we showed some details earlier and I'll show some more details. Um, you know, it may look like portions of the floor assembly are in the wall assembly, but um, it's actually, you know, with platform construction, you have um, the wall above bearing on the floor assembly and then that in turn bears on the wall assembly below. So the correct answer is B exterior walls. And uh, so here's an enlarged excerpt of uh, one of the example wall floor intersection details that's in DCA3. This one is an example in which both rim board and blocking are used. When, when exposed to fire from the interior, the wood blocking and the ceiling membrane provide protection to the rim board, which transmits the load from the wall above to the wall below. When exposed from the exterior, uh, that is when it's required to be uh, rated from the exterior based on uh, fire separation distance, a combination of the exterior fire protection and then also the fire retardant uh, treated sheathing and also the uh, a portion of the rim board uh, provides protection to the blocking here. And the blocking is what would carry the load in, in the case of uh, exposure from the exterior. So, Regardless of whether you have exposure from the interior or from the exterior, um, there's always one element that uh, is capable and capable of carrying the load and protected for that purpose. This second detail differs from the first one in that it presents a, a case in which there are two rim board members side by side uh, instead of having one rim board member and, and then some blocking uh, adjacent to it. But other than that, the, this detail is pretty much the same and it uses the same rationale as the, uh, the one that I just showed you. Uh, it's not shown on these excerpts, but each of these example details in DCA3 is also accompanied with explanations of how the fire resistance rating is achieved from the interior side and then also if necessary from the exterior side. And of course, as Paul noted, you know, it's required from the exterior side if you have a fire separation distance of 10 feet or less. Here's the third example, which presents a case in which there is one rim board and no blocking. 
uh, in this example, rim board would have to be fairly thick. The rim board would have to be fairly thick in order to still support the load even after loss of some of the section due to charring. These first three example details deal with type 3A construction in which the floor ceiling assembly is required to have a one hour fire resistance rating. As you can see in this diagram, there are three different cases presented, each corresponding to a different ceiling membrane configuration. That's case A, case B, and case C. The idea is that since the ceiling membrane provides a certain amount of protection to the wall floor intersection, this will affect how much resistance is required uh, of the blocking or rim board um, when it, once it starts to be exposed in order to uh, still carry the load and transmit the load from the wall above to the wall below. And um, of course, this applies to when you have exposure from the interior as opposed to the exterior. These different cases are referred to as cases A, B, and C, as I just mentioned, and uh, each case You'll see over here, each of these cases uh, corresponds to a different minimum thickness required of the rim board itself. So basically, if there's less protection provided by the ceiling membrane, this has to be compensated for by additional thickness in the rim board in order to uh, maintain the uh, continuity of the two hour fire resistance rating. And then the fourth example detail, uh, this addresses type 3B construction, whereas the first three were uh, type 3A construction. So in type 3B construction, of course, the floor ceiling assembly is unrated. Um, there's no, well, I should say there's no rating requirement. So uh, in type 3B, so these detail, this detail assumes that the floor ceiling rate assembly is unrated and uh, conservatively um, no, no contribution to protection is assumed from the ceiling membrane, even though in reality there probably would be some degree of protection provided by that ceiling membrane. It's completely neglected in uh, in this this particular detail for type 3B. So that means all of the protection has to come from the uh, a combination of the blocking and or rim board, and that's why you see so much here of the uh, blocking um, to provide enough thickness so that even after a portion of the section is lost due to um, exposure, to, due to fire exposure, uh, you still have a section left that can carry the load, transmit the load, and provide continuity. Briefly, I also wanted to point out that uh, each of these figures um, indicates which of the member, which of the wood members are required to be fire retardant treated in these details. The requirement for using fire retardant treated, treatment, treated wood in uh, exterior walls of type three construction, as I mentioned, is uh, it applies you know, to the walls and uh, to the sheathing and the framing that's in the walls. These don't show the studs, but uh, the studs would also have to be fire retardant treated. So you have the, um, the sill plates and, uh, and the sheathing on the exterior wall and the studs would all have to be fire retardant treated. Uh, however, there is no explicit requirement for the uh, for any members in the floor ceiling assembly to be fire retardant treated. So these are not shown in red. They're not required to be fire retardant treated. And uh, I wanted to reiterate a point that Paul made also that um, the whole purpose of uh, of having or having that requirement for fire retardant treated. Uh, lumber in the wall assembly is uh, it deals with uh, flame spread. That's um, that's what uh, fire retardant treated wood is. Uh, that's how it's qualified, and that's what it does. Is it uh, it decreases flame spread? And so, um, you know, in the in the wall, it, it makes sense to have that fire retardant treated wood. There's no such rationale for um, you know for flame spread because flame spread, of course, is a very different concept from uh, as Paul made reference to from fire uh, fire resistance. So the details with all of the blocking and the uh, rim board here deal with fire resistance and continuity thereof, not with flame spread. And uh, so those are two very different concepts. They need to be kept separate. So in these last few remaining slides, I want to, uh, I better hurry up and get, uh, get through these because I wanted to, to uh, talk about the sound rating uh, the sound ratings that are provided in DCA3. Um, Paul already told us about uh, where the sound ratings are required, and he also touched on um, 
the uh, different requirements for airborne uh, sound transmission versus structure borne. Um, again, airborne sound transmission uh, examples include uh, amplified electronic devices, human voices, pets, and musical instruments, and so on. And uh, the provisions apply both to floor ceiling and, and wall assemblies. And recall that the minimum STC is 50 for that. Then for structure-borne sound transmission, that's covered in IBC section 1206.3. And uh, the minimum IIC, impact insulation class, is 50 as well for that. And those uh, examples of uh, structure-borne sound, uh, sounds include footfall, noise, objects falling on the floor, and other impacts that are directly upon the structure itself. So Marcy, can you uh, pull the uh, audience for this question here? One last quick poll. What ways can the code required minimum STC and uh, IIC ratings be demonstrated for an assembly. A, ongoing full-scale structural monitoring. B, direct laboratory testing for ASTM E90 and E492. C, engineering analysis from comparisons to other lab tests. Or D, either answers B or C. Again, that's either answers B or C. And 91% say either answers B or C. All what do you right, say, that's Jason? Great. Well, good. Okay. Well, then I won't uh, dwell on that. That's uh, that is correct. Either uh, laboratory testing or engineering analysis. I guess we've probably mentioned that uh, maybe one too many times, but that's a good thing, though. It uh, it has yielded uh, positive results. Um, the sound rating data that's given in DCA three uh, they were all established by a combination of both of these code allowed methods that we just talked about there, and um, uh, some of the sound some of the sound rating data was derived from testing and then also uh, some of it was derived using uh, engineering analysis that's based on comparisons to uh, to data from other tests and uh, so therefore wherever the sound ratings given in DCA3 are greater than the code specified minimum of 50 for STC and IIC they can be used to demonstrate compliance with code provisions or code requirements Although DCA3 does not currently give sound rating data for, for the wall assemblies, it does give sound ratings for all of the floor ceiling assemblies that are provided within DCA3. And because, because these are floor ceiling assemblies, it gives both STC and IIC values. These sound ratings are provided for various configurations of each assembly, which correspond to some of the optional variations that I mentioned earlier when I was talking about the fire resistance ratings. Uh, most of the estimated values were determined using the AWC sound transmission model, which is presented in Technical Report 15 or TR15. And the rest of the sound ratings were obtained, like I said, through laboratory testing. So this is the last slide, and I just before we close, I wanted to uh, to really show you this uh, this example. This is an excerpt of one of the sound rating tables in DCA3. A table like this is provided for each of the eight floor ceiling assemblies uh, that are presented in DCA3. As you can see in this table, STC and IIC values are given for each, for uh, not each variation, but certain variations of each assembly, both with, uh, with and without gypsum concrete topping. And uh, values for two different floor covering types are also given. Specifically, these two floor covering types are cushion vinyl and carpet and pad, because the reason these two were chosen is because they serve as representative floor coverings that yield a, a very different IIC result. Uh, so they somewhat envelope the practical range of values for uh, various floor coverings on these assemblies. And then the last assembly variation for which sound ratings are provided is joist spacing. You can see the two different rows there for two different spacings. Ratings are given for both 24 and 16 inch on center joist spacings. And uh, all of the fire resistance ratings in DCA3 correspond to a maximum joist spacing of 24 inches. But as I mentioned earlier, lesser joist spacings are allowed and you can still achieve those fire resistance ratings. They do affect the sound ratings as you can see, but um, not usually generally not to a major extent. And with that, I'm going to conclude and uh, turn it back over to Marcy so that we can see what kind of questions may, co may have come in. This is Michelle Cam Biron, Senior Director of Education, and I'm helping with the 
Q&A part of the webinar. So we have a few questions that have come in. Great to interaction from the audience. And let me bring that up. Um, this first question is for Paul. What are the limits on penetrations in firewalls or fire resistant rated walls? Well, the, the key there uh, is that they may differ uh, depending on whether it's a firewall or a fire barrier or a fire partition. But uh, uh, you may remember, um, just a general rule, just as a reminder, um, they all have their own sets of restrictions. You have to follow the code path. Start with the section on firewalls. If it's a firewall, start with the section on fire barriers, uh, if it's a fire barrier and so forth. So openings in those might be limited in area. They also might have to be have a fire protection rating, a tested uh, fire protected rated assembly in the opening. And then penetrations may be limited in different ways depending on you know, what element it is, the barrier, fire resistance rated barrier, fire wall, fire partition, but you do have to start with the individual sections for each. Great, great feedback. Uh, then I have another one for Jason that came in. Can you comment on solutions for achieving code specific minimum sound ratings? with light frame assemblies that don't have carpet or gypsum concrete topping? Ooh, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah, that is a good question because um, as that question, as that uh, person probably noted and maybe they've run into issues with this is uh, that, you know, the gypsum, uh, gypsum concrete um, and also um, carpet and pad floor coverings, that either used separately or in combination, they tend to uh, to really improve your sound ratings, especially for uh, for carpet and pad, for that improves your STC um, and IIC, uh, I'm sorry, IIC, and then uh, the, uh, the gypsum concrete adds mass, so it uh, really improves both, provided that you're not uh, as, as long as you don't have a, um, a hard surface applied directly over that gypsum concrete. Now, the question I think what they're asking is, are there are there solutions for, are there ways that you can achieve the code specified minimum of 50 if you don't have those two components, a carpet and pad and uh, gypsum concrete? The answer is yes, there are options. You can achieve them. In fact, there's even one in, uh, there's one assembly in DCA3 that uh, that does meet that minimum um, minimum code specified STC and IIC without the gypsum concrete and carpet and pad. Uh, and then, of course, there are variations to that assembly. So there are there are options available, but uh, it is true that um, if you add either you know either one of those components or other uh, a lot of a lot of them are proprietary comp components that you could add that would really improve the overall performance in a, for the sound rating. Great. But the short answer is yes, there are. <laughs> Good in-depth answer. Thanks, Jason. So we'll go what, two more questions for one for each of you um, since we're getting late in the time. But here's one for Paul. This is a good one because we get this question a lot. What about intumescent paint or field applied paints for fire resistance? Are there any that are acceptable and how are they acceptable, et cetera? Okay, <clears throat> so paints, coatings, and so forth in 2303.2 for fire retardant created wood, they're, they're pretty much excluded if they're a topical or a surface treatment from automatically qualifying as fire retardant treated wood. Now there are definitely products that may work well that are approved through the alternate materials and methods procedure by submitting testing uh, that shows that they can perform as is in, as fire retardant treated as in an equivalent way to the performance of fire retardant treated wood, uh, but but those, that that typically has to be an alternative methods and materials uh, procedure um, if it's a topical uh, or an intumescent. Uh, that would definitely they would have to submit their test reports. The code official would make the determination mm -hmm. for those. Great. That's through uh, the alternate means in Chapter 1, correct? 104.11, right? Michelle. Awesome. 
Okay, Jason, we have one more for you, and this is a good one. What resources are available for determining sound ratings of assemblies which differ from tested assemblies? Well, okay, yeah, we have, um, as a matter of fact, uh, one thing that we've talked about several times in this webinar so far is that there are two different means by which sound ratings can be established. Uh, either through direct testing and, and actually within the testing option, there are two different uh, means. There's laboratory testing and field testing. Um, those are both acceptable. But then uh, besides testing, engineering analysis is acceptable. And uh, AWC has, uh, within the past couple of years, has developed a, um, a an empirical model for uh, calculating uh, STC and IIC values of um, a certain uh, uh, floor ceiling assembly uh, type. So it's it it applies to a range of different floor ceiling assemblies, but um, but there are of course there's a, a scope uh, a, a limitation on uh, you know the range of floor ceiling assembly types that it applies to. But uh, that model is explained. It's described in Technical Report 15, which I made brief reference to when I was uh, when I was talking earlier. Um, TR15 is available for uh, for free on the AWC website, and that uh, that explains the procedure by which these uh, this type of analysis can be performed. And then also um, at some point, probably within the next year, uh, probably hopefully uh, the first half of 2020, um, we are going to go online with a uh, with a an app that will allow for uh, doing this calculation really easily, um, you know, for for assemblies that are within the scope of the model. And of course, if you try to use, if you try to analyze an assembly that's outside of the scope, it'll let you know that, and it won't uh, won't let you go any further. But for assemblies within the scope, which all of these assemblies that we've been talking about here are within the scope, um, you know, that it'll uh, it'll be a very useful tool. This web app. Great. Awesome. Uh, there is a lot of useful information and resources on our website, awc.org. And I think that's about it. And I want to thank our guest speakers, Jason Smart and Paul Coates, for providing us a, with a really great presentation. And for those of you that haven't done so yet, please uh, respond to the survey that is sent to you in the chat box and we want to thank you for joining us if you have some friends that would like to watch this webinar we are going to have it available on our website in our e-courses or if you would like to review the webinar it'll be available for you to watch for free uh, within a week and I want to thank our team, our awesome team that helps put this together. That's Lori Cook, Marcy Weber, and Suzanne Termat. They're awesome, and we wouldn't be able to do these webinars without their help. And thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we wish you a happy holidays. Thanks, everyone.